It's just remarkable, just the history of Colonel Norris and what one man can do. He was a poet, he was a writer, he, um, he built up Nortown. He was one of the first superintendents to Yellowstone. He has a huge legacy. A dedicated group in a Detroit neighborhood is trying to restore one of the city's oldest homes, and you can help by going to a party. So I head to the two-way in to chat with Danielle Pantaloresco. Then we'll dive into a few stories around town. It's Wednesday, August 14th, 2019. I'm Jer Stays, and welcome to Your Daily Detroit. Let's get started in a minute. Daily Detroit is brought to you in part by Lawrence Tech. Traditional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track, and most classes are conveniently offered evenings at LTU's beautiful Southfield campus or online, yes, the internet. So you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Find out more at ltu.edu, and we'll have a link in the show notes. Up on Mount Elliott Street, roughly between Nevada and Davison, sits a set of buildings with a deep connection to Detroit's past. The neighborhood is known as Nortown, but it doesn't just refer to North as many may think. It harkens back to Colonel Philetus Norris, a Union Civil War veteran who drove the founding of the village of Norris, the draining of a creek to help create a road to Mount Clemens, and a pair of places that still stand today that hold some keys to our city's history, among, well, many other accomplishments. The village was originally defined by Seven Mile, Mound, Six Mile, and that's now labeled McNichols, and Van Dyke. From what I can tell, it was mostly inhabited by farmers who sold their goods to Eastern Market. Eventually, the land was first annexed into Hamtramck Township, which looked little like the Hamtramck of today. It ran from the Detroit River by Belle Isle all the way up to the county line, which is now Eight Mile. And then, in about 1916, this area was added to the city of Detroit. So I paid a visit to Detroit Dive Bar Royalty and the keeper of the legendary two-way in, Danielle Pantaloresco, to learn more about what's happening. She grew up at the bar. So basically, I lived in the big haunted spooky mansion. <laughs> so it was just very interesting. Our basement that used to be the jail, that's like a museum. So sometimes I'll just go down there, rummage through something for 30 minutes, find something really cool, take a picture of it, put it on our Facebook. You know, it's, it's fun. Everything that's on the walls has been found in-house. So it's not like we go on eBay and, you know, old Stroh's sign. It's, no, we, we have one. We have many. It is, in fact, the old Stro sign from this place that's been used for years. So how old is this place? It was built in 1870, and then it was a functioning business in 1873. So it was the first business in Nortown, Detroit, which was this room, and that was the general store. And why is it called the 2 a.m.? A two-way in is actually a style of a building. It's a term from the 1800s. It means nothing in our English language today. So basically, when people were building things, there was no codes. There was no, you know, people looking over their floor plans. So people were just building things kind of however they wanted, and they were making horrible mistakes. They were not building enough doors, enough exits, enough windows. So if there was a fire in this room and this room had the door, people were getting trapped. So a two-way in was a safe word. It meant that there was two ways in and out of every single room in this building, no matter how big or how small. And it was just to ensure your safety that you could get out quickly if you needed to. So they would say, go to Nortown, there's a two-way in. And in that very short sentence, you got a ton of information. Then as the 1900s go on, there were laws, there were codes that you had to abide by. So you would not have to call something a two-way in. So we're the last two-way in in the nation. I kind of want to get into this Norris house. And it's kind of why we're here to talk with you today. What is this place? Why is it so important? It's had a lot of ups and downs, let's just say, over the last few years. Yeah, well, the Norris house means a lot to us. So when Colonel Norris came here after the Civil War, he built the two-way and then he built his family home right away. So his family home, you know, that's what we call the Norris house. It's been there since, you know, the 1870s. 
and it's a historical landmark in the east side of Detroit. And we're just trying to preserve that, preserve that history. Any any neighborhood has rich history, and that's what we're trying to bring awareness to. His home, his legacy, he was a major part of the east side of Detroit. He was a major part of American history, being a Civil War veteran, a spy for the Union. And we would love to make it into like maybe a community center or a place where people can go and take pictures or just have it, you know, just a, a staple for us. We have the 2A and we have some other functioning business, but we also want things that are um, from the past, too. But right now we just need the construction going. And I understand part of the challenge with that is that there was a fire, right? Yeah, there was a fire about two years ago on 4th of July. Um, it's said to be arson. And that was just a huge devastating blow. So a lot of the house is just gone. So basically there's just a small part. Um, there's a staircase that we're trying to preserve. A man by the name of Carl, he's from um, 555 Arts Detroit. He had a huge part this spring putting the roof on and we're just trying to salvage what we have. You grew up here. Why do you love this neighborhood so much? I love this neighborhood. So the Norris house was where I would take my children and we would go on picnics and we would kind of use that as our own personal yard. It was like a little forest back there. And it's just remarkable, just the history of Colonel Norris and what one man can do. He was a poet. He was a writer. He, um, he built up Nortown. He was one of the first superintendents to Yellowstone. He has a huge legacy. And just to keep his name going for us is important. And we just really want to draw attention to him and what his efforts were for, for this community. Well, and how are things going here at the two-way? Because I can personally endorse drinking here is a lot of fun. But how are things going here? I mean, because people may or may not think of this corner of town for, you know, going out and having a good time. But frankly, it's one of the remaining outposts of drink. If you think about the fact we've lost the uh, Tom's Tavern, we've lost a few other places. How are things going and, you know, what's going on here? Well, we were Dive Bar of the Year. We were named that just this past few months, Dive Bar of the Year for North America. We were on Thrillist, 33 top dive bars in America. We're the first one on that list. We are just featured in a documentary with Kathy Drasky. It's called Uncle Frank's House. We get a lot of publicity, which is nice, but the two-way is just still the same old two-way. We have people here that are, you know, they'll come in, they're 80, and they would say, oh, I used to come here with my dad. And I just say, you know, like so many things around us change, but what hasn't changed is the two-way. It's still the same old stomping ground. It's a pit stop from here to downtown. The term dive bar, do you embrace that? And what do you think makes a good dive bar? What are a couple of the keys for, for you for success? We are a dive bar. So a dive bar to me is a place that has a $2 beer. We're very blue collar. If you're waiting over here at the bus stop and you just got a couple bucks in your pocket and you want to grab a cold one, we're that place. We're never going to be a martini bar. We're never trying to be something that we're not. This is a very industrial neighborhood. So you have a lot of guys coming in here that just have 30 minutes for lunch and they just got a couple bucks in their pocket. And those are the guys that we want. Those are the people that we're looking for. So many places now, they open later. That's like the new trend in bars. They don't open till seven or eight. Um, a lot of things are just strictly craft, craft cocktails or craft beer. Sure, we have craft beer, but we just try to bring it down to the, you know, the basics of this is a bar. We're shot in a beer bar. Come one, come all. We have a wide variety of, you know, people that come in, young, old, doesn't matter. So the Norris House, it sounds really cool. It sounds like a great piece of Detroit history. But I understand there's a way that people get involved to help save it. For sure. So this Saturday, August 17th, will be the Colonel's 198th birthday. And to honor him, we're doing a fundraiser for the house. And it's going to be from 2 to 7. And basically, we're going to have food. And you can you buy the food. And 100% of the proceeds from the food go towards the cause. We're going to have a donation bucket if you can't stay. Um, we're going to do uh, raffles. And it's a family-friendly event. We're going to have the yard open and try to get some cornhole going in the back. And we just basically want people to come in and maybe do a walk over to the Norris house so people can see uh, what Carl and Pat Bosch and John Bosch have been doing over the summer. They can just really see with their own eyes and try to get a vision of what the house once looked like. 
And also we're looking for artists. We're looking for sculptors who have you know, some ideas for Nortown. I would love to see some welcome to Nortown signs. We would love some maybe street art. And you can always contact the two-way if you'd be interested or the Nortown CDC. We, we're open to anything. We're open to donations. We're open to ideas. You know, people are so um, thrilled about the coming back of Detroit and downtown looks so beautiful in the waterfront. But there's also these little neighborhoods, the east side. And we're kind of out here in no man's land, but just as important. Here's a few more things you should know around town. Ford is extending warranties on 560,000 Focus and Fiesta vehicles equipped with PowerShift dual-clutch automatic transmissions. Ford will reimburse 2014 to 2016 model year Focus customers and 2014 to 2015 model year Fiesta customers for clutch repairs they paid for out of pocket. But it's also in context of a massive investigation by the Detroit Free Press of clutch issues with the vehicles, something that Sven talked about in depth right here on the podcast with the Freep's Randy Essex a couple of weeks ago. The Freep said the company knew that the transmissions were defective before they put them on the market. Ford says this warranty extension is independent of any media or litigation, and litigation is pending in multiple countries. One of the things that's interesting about the Focus is that it seems to have been designed as a car for seniors, with wider doors, sight lines, and other adaptations. When initially conceived, test drivers wore suits to simulate slower response times and other issues older folks dealt with, and that was the genesis of some of its unique features. However, Ford soon decided that, according to the Center for Universal Design, quote, you can sell a young man's car to an old man, but you can't sell an old man's car to a young man. And that part of the marketing plan was scrapped. Speaking of automotive, Completed in 1909, Woodward Avenue between six and seven mile roads was the first mile of paved highway in the world, and it got a newly refurbished marker today. The restoration of the historic sign was made possible by a grant from Motor City's National Heritage Area, along with support from Hegarty Insurance. According to press materials, Cruise in the D, Detroit Entertainment Commission, and the Ford Paquette Avenue Plant Museum lent their support as well. There's development happening on vacant Illich-owned land up in Farmington Hills. Mercedes-Benz Financial will lease space where the Little Caesars headquarters was planned to be before it moved to downtown Detroit. A new 200,000-square-foot building will be constructed, and it'll be home to about 1,000 jobs. It'll also be the base of Daimler Mobility Americas. According to a news release, construction starts in the fall, and it will be ready in the summer of 2021. I've A new soft-serve ice cream shop is open in downtown Detroit called Huddle. It's in a walk-up window on John R., just east of Woodward, that used to be home to Chickpea and the D. Huddle plans to be open year-round with what looks to be a simple menu. You can get a chocolate, vanilla, or a swirl soft-serve, and toppings such as sprinkles, sea salt, and mini chocolate chips. There are floats, too, including Verner's. As to what the pricing is like, a basic cone will set you back 4 bucks and float 6 bucks. Toppings are extra. In a follow-up to a previous story, the Oakland County suburb of Royal Oak has a new interim city manager. The Royal Oak Tribune reports city attorney David Gillum will take the job under a six-month contract, and he'll continue to supervise legal affairs. Before I let you go, a reminder, the Dream Cruise is this weekend on Woodward throughout Oakland County. So if you live in those parts, uh, either dive all the way in, Or if cars are not your thing, Woodward will not be the place to be. So that'll do it for today's Daily Detroit. If you like the show, take a screenshot of it on your phone and tag our Instagram, Daily Detroit. We'll be sure to give it some love. I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.